Untamed. Five, four, three, two, one. The Platform. Welcome to the iOS podcast, ladies and gentlemen. Every single night here, we put together the highlights of today's show, which aired on the platform live 1 till 4 p.m. Again, I've got to keep reminding you, if you're brand new to this podcast, we broadcast 1 till 4 every afternoon, a live sports show, the only independent sports show in New Zealand. You've got to download the platform app and if you subscribe to Platform Plus, just three bucks a week. Well, there's a heck of a lot of other benefits attached. Jump the website or download that app. It is all very explanatory. Today, an exclusive interview with the boss of Team New Zealand, Grant Dalton. The America's Cup kicks off in August in Barcelona. We've just had a regatta in Jeddah. Of course, our two main boys, uh, Chuk and Burling, uh, in sale GP at the moment. Grant Dalton talks about all of that, plus the possibility of of it ever the ac coming back to auckland mark watson the atm podcast apologize to me episode 66 today and when are the wallabies gonna get a new coach and the lions have already named their coach for 2025 well in advance who is going to be the wallabies new coach and when are they going to announce it who are the front runners christy doran from the raw out of brisbane explaining all of this to us on the podcast as well we begin the program as always. I say tablets in hand. I gather my flock. It's time for a sermon. Hey, Nori. Hey, Old Meyer. You you gotta want to hear this. Let's go to the mountaintop. We live in an amazing, amazing world, and it's wasted on the crappiest generation of just spoiled idiots. Daniel Altmaier, German professional tennis player. You fake. Daniel Altmaier, you fraud. You are a disingenuous pretender and you deserve to be called out for it. Yesterday, I did a big moan Monday about Altmaier and Cam Norrie, two high-profile tennis players who both withdrew from the ASB Classic last week, citing injuries too hurt to play. Norrie is ranked 19th in the world, Altmaier 57th. And as soon as I heard that these two players had both withdrawn, Altmaier last Thursday after losing the first set, one little down in the second, withdrew back injury. I was immediately suspicious. Were they in fact injured? Or was it more just all a little too convenient to withdraw? Knowing that the Aussie Open was starting a few days away, they wanted to save themselves for that. This is what I said yesterday. (laughs) The ASB Classic. Mm, I worry about this tournament. I only worry about it Because I think that it has been treated as a bit of a joke, a bit of a glorified training run by some of the players. Certainly the men's event anyway. All eyes this week are now on Cam Norrie and the German player Daniel Altmaier at the Australian Open. Both of these guys were high-profile injury, and I say that in inverted commas, withdrawals from the ASB last week. It was a wrist injury for Norrie and back for Altmaier. Mm. Now, look, I'm not saying they weren't injured, but I am questioning whether the injuries were so serious that they had to dick the fans and diddle the event, pulling the pussy moves that they did. Is that a bit harsh? Is that a bit harsh, saving themselves for the Australian Open? Because that's very obviously what it looked like. A little too convenient for these eyes. And guess what? Yes, I was right. I'm not being smarmy about this. It was so goddamn obvious. Of course I was right. Yesterday, Altmaier played Kashinov in the first round at the Aussie Open. He was on court, forget this, four hours, two minutes. Four hours, two minutes, battling, chasing down balls, physically exerting himself to the max. He gave it everything. I I tuned in and watched because I just wanted to see how freely he was moving. There was no back injury. Four days after withdrawing, he goes four intense sets. So what about that bad back, Daniel? How miraculous that deep heat rub works, huh? Cam Norrie today, same thing. Wrist injury or not, or convenient excuse. All eyes on him. Both of these guys owe an apology to the ASB Classic. Both of them deserve to be called out for it. Both of them deserve to be found out for the fake that they put in here in Auckland last week. Cam Norrie, Daniel Altmaier, you deserve a sir. What do you want? We want information 
Information. You won't get it. The platform. And Nori has just started, ladies and gentlemen, against Vies. We will keep you updated with how long poor Cam manages to stay on court with that devastating wrist injury he's carrying. Lock, what have we got headlines-wise? Ah, plenty as always, Martin. I can't actually say that, to be fair, for a Tuesday, but there's actually a lot going round. I'm going to have to cut back my bulletin here. I'll start off with some uh, troubling news involving a former All Black. Uh, that former All Black being Byron Callagher, halfback for a long time. Uh, he is in trouble with the Let law. Let me guess, domestic again. violence? Again. Is it? Oh, B- really? Bingo. What bingo. a surprise. He's already been done about half a dozen times. 47 years of age, he's set to appear in a French court today after his former partner accused him of domestic violence. This according to French newspaper La Parisienne. According to his former partner, Callahan was verbally and physically violent after she gave birth to their son and their relationship ended in 2015. Uh, Super Rugby News, the Blues have named 43 Test All Black Patrick Tui Pilotu as captain for this season replacing fellow All Black Dalton Papali'i. Interesting move by new coach Vern Cotter. More news involving All Blacks. This one, another former All Black. Uh, Ma'anunu has signed on for another season. Yeah, I love this. In the, the United great States. Story, great story. He's 41. Yeah, he's San, still he's playing. San Diego, isn't he? Yeah. Brilliant. Absolutely yeah. brilliant. And major league major rugby. League rugby. Yeah. Uh, Nottingham Forest and Everton could face points deductions after being formally charged with breaches of the English Premier League's profitability and sustainability rules. Everton, of course, already appealing an earlier 10-point deduction, the biggest sanction in Premier League history. Uh, and the Liverpool-based club in Forest now have 14 days to answer the Premier League's latest charges. No Chelsea or Man City? No? They haven't broken it? Oh, OK. OK. Oh, fair. I guess it makes sense. Uh, Lionel Messi has been named uh, FIFA's best men's player. Uh, Spanish World Cup champion Aitana Bonmati has been named top women's player. I believe Bonmati also won the Women's Ballon d'Or Award. Uh, Messi won the Ballon d'Or Award as well, didn't he? The, the end of last year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yep. they both uh, won this, these ones as well. Uh, Turkish authorities have charged Israeli soccer player Sajiv Jehezkul with inciting hatred after he expressed solidarity with people held hostage by the Hamas militant organisation during a top-flight league game. Uh, the body of a former Socceroo, Stephen Labutt, has been found in bushland on the New South Wales far north coast after he was reported missing on Saturday. 46 uh, years of age. Yeah, that's not great. Yeah, he had travelled from Sydney to Casarina, I hope I pronounced that right, north of Byron Bay, uh, to visit friends on Friday. Police were alerted on Saturday morning when he could not be contacted. Found dead in the bushland. Yeah, OK, now you know what that means, mate. That's the big S. Uh, that's ugly. Mm. Well, he made headlines when he came out as gay after retiring from professional sport. And he was speaking to the Sydney Morning Herald in 2021 that he could never have done so while playing football. I hope it's got... Hasn't got a connection to that. Uh, but um, anyway. Uh, and finally, the Australian Open continues today. A number of big names taking the court, including uh, your best friend, Martin, Cam Norrie. He's on now. He lost the first game. Carlos Alcaraz. Well, he's injured. Of course he's going to lose. Carlos Alcaraz is also playing Alexander Zverev, uh, Elena Rybakina, Jessica Pagula, Victoria Azarenka, Iga Svontek, among many, many others. They're playing. Andy Murray played uh, yesterday. He is a five-time Australian Open finalist. He lost to Thomas Martin Echeverry, 646262. But he said it might be the last time he can test the season's first major. These are direct quotes from Andy Murray. I won't win many matches playing that way. It's definitely possible that this will be the last time I play here. Touchdown, Buffalo Bill! Oh, I cashed out at the right time, cashed didn't I? Cashed out at the right time, oh. Well done. All right. Devian. Oh, my goodness me! The platform. Grant Dalton, Team New Zealand boss. A man who certainly polarises the sporting audience in New Zealand. He lost, he lost, he lost, and then he won in Bermuda. And then was at the helm, well, not of the boat, but of the organisation, as Team New Zealand defended the Cup a few years back against Luna Rossa here in Auckland. Well, took it offshore to Barcelona. That caused a heck of a lot of controversy. But if you listen to Grant Dalton, had to do it. What is the possibility of that Cup coming back here, hosting it here again in Auckland? He explains about that. Plus... What happens between now and when the regatta gets underway in Barcelona? Is it harder to win it, to defend it, or is it going to be harder to defend it again? Harder to defend it again. And there's a, there's a number of reasons for that. And that's really why I guess we, we were so brutal in our debrief after, after 21. Um, because nobody's actually ever defended it three times. Or won it and defended it twice. And there's some pretty simple reasons for that. One is that the teams get soft. Um, 
they stop making the hard decisions on people. And, they, and so their development, and they start maybe giving too much uh, authority to certain people that really, just because they've been there a long time, think they should have it. And it's easier to say yes than no. So, so um, to win at this time, and we've been busy teaching these other teams now, you know, culturally what they need to be like. So I think it's going to be considerably harder. I think, contrary to what a lot of people think, um, the advantage of being offshore is quite a big one for us because the hometown advantage is actually a disadvantage in so much as, you know, your auntie's having a birthday and the neighbour wants to have a chat and it's all a bit soft. But, you know, Team New Zealand raids well and, and we saw that when we were, spent a good part of last summer in Barcelona. We just go to work. That's why we're there. We're there to sail, we're there to race, we're there to develop and we just go to work. And so I think that's definitely in our favour going into the next cup, though. What do you mean by culturally teaching or culturally improving the other side? What does that mean? Uh, well, I mean, Team New Zealand has a pretty flat structure um, in terms of its management. We, we all get on very well, uh, although not so much that it makes us soft. And a lot of these other teams, and it's really particularly quite European, is a quite you know dominant management, dominant um, and, and, and Team New Zealand's just not like that. You know, we have an executive group, but it's large. Uh, we have good, robust meetings and design. People's opinions are, you know, valued. Uh, and and it's, although it sounds quite basic, yeah, well, of course it'll be like that. America's Cup teams don't tend to be like that because ultimately, usually they've got a one dominant financial player who has a hell of a say, as so he should, it's his money. Uh, in it, and, and that can you know spiral its way down the organisation where people are, are, are you know too 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 timid to, to squeak. And the other thing about Team New Zealand is we don't we're not blessed with colossal sums of money like these other teams, and so we have a pretty much a culture of you know if it's if it isn't going to make the boat go better, then there's no point we can't spend it. And so no is the most common word. No, we won't do that. No, we won't do that. No, you can't prove that. And that makes a team internally quite robust because you know you know that to 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 be able to um, get a project through you're not going to get a yes unless it's well researched and and you know knots on the table can be proved did you hold back technology from last time i mean there was any kind of thing that you had that you could have used that would have made the boat go faster then that you can use now and uh, no no that was that was that was the best boat we could put on the water as i say I think we've improved as a sailing team considerably. So, you know, I, you know, who knows whether our new boat's going to be this far, fast enough? It certainly, we certainly hope it will be. But, um, you know, what we would have wanted to put on the water last time is a, is a more um, rounded package in terms of the, the integration and the boat and the people and the sailing team. And this time, I think we're headed that way. Now, is that good enough to win? I'm not suggesting that it necessarily is, but, but. This is a considerably improved Emirates team New Zealand than you saw defend the cup in twenty one. What do you fear from your from your rivals? What do you fear that they if there's you know that they might have that you don't? Is there anything out there that you think, my God, we haven't thought of that? Well, if I knew what that was, I already would have thought of it. And so, you know, when, now when you introduce one of the dangers of being the people that designed the rule of the boats, you know, the, the document that you that you design your boats from is that you think you know what it should say. Now, when you aren't that person who designed it, you don't care what you think it should say. You care about what you think is the best and fastest solution. And and certainly that's a danger because, well, we didn't mean it to say that. Well, it doesn't matter what we meant. That's what they've done. Um, uh, and, and I think also with introducing, you know, Mercedes Formula One team and the Red Bull, uh, Formula One team, I mean, they play on a different level and, and in different areas. And they could be playing with some technology that we haven't even heard of, let alone thought of. And so that's certainly a fear um, that there's just something we haven't turned over because we just didn't know and we didn't or didn't think it was relevant. Um, and so it's really probably a, only a design breakthrough somewhere that would worry me. I certainly as a, it's, you know, an organisation... Um, putting together our America's Cup sailing team to go out and defend the Cup. I think we're, you know, as I say, certainly in my time, we're completely, com 
seriously stronger than we've ever been. Is 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 there anything that you know takes place between now and then that you have to keep completely under wraps? Like what is what is what is your biggest secret? Well, if I told you that, it wouldn't be a secret, would there it? There you go. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, well, I think that this, the joint recon, and basically what that means is that we, instead of everybody having bloody spies with every, you know, following every team and spending a bloody fortune, we'd have to have five separate recon teams to follow the other teams. We've pulled that into one pool of recon, which all teams draw from. So it's dropped cost of recon by, well, damn it, millions. And um, um, so it's pretty hard, if not impossible. And if you hide something, from the recon, there's penalties for that, you know. So I, 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 don't, I think it'll be under the skin, what you can't see under the skin, the control systems, because the mast, well, you don't know what the modulus of the mast is, but you know it's a mast, and you know the beam characteristics just through photos. Um, the foils, the sails, the hull shape, all those things are out there in the open when the boats are launched. So I think that the, the, the thing that the teams don't show because you can't see it, is how their control systems are going to work. And you say, well, well that doesn't sound like a big deal. But control systems this time could be the, the winning and the losing of the cup. What happens between now and Barcelona then, and when do we see these boats? Well, we, we um, the guys have just had a great result in Abu Dhabi, uh, and we start sailing again here on Wednesday. Um, uh, we're back into testing in, in our um, LEQ-12, it was 40-footer. Uh, um, our other 40 is on its way back from Genestal, uh, so then we can get back into two boat racing, and then the new boat comes on stream in a few months, and then you know it's bloody sail that for a bit, get it on a ship, get it to Barcelona, and we're into it. So it'll come around pretty quick. I mean, there is always a cliche, but it's very true. You, America's Cup, the one thing you can't buy is time, and we're always fighting the clock. Now, I think we're quite good at that as an organization, we tend to hit our our, our, you know, our deadlines, and that's because we can control our own environment to a point. Because we've got our own yard, we build our own boats, we do our own, you know, do all our own equipment. Uh, but we've just got to, we've got to watch the clock every every single day, literally. Are they going to look any different to us, you know, land lovers, when we see these boats? Are they oh going yeah. To... Oh really? Well, I don't know what the other guys are going to look like, but I can tell you they're going to look different, all right. How much you faster know, are they mean, going when to? We, when we launched to Rarotai. It was really different, you know, and, and now it's kind of, it's a, basically a battleship. And like it's an old bus that goes, you know, off to Motat with it. Right. So that's how quick it moves. Um, and because this is only the second iteration of the rule, the teams will come together a lot more this time in hull shapes, but they'll still diverge a bit. And, yeah, I can absolutely guarantee you, you'll see boats that you ain't seen before in <laughs> shape. Yes or no, any chance it could ever come back here? We host it again? Absolutely. I mean, you know, as I said, when we went, you know, to, to you know, sometimes you've got to burn the village to save the village. And, and you know, I don't think we realised how bad it was going to get when we made that, you know, reaching decision to take the cup away in the first place. Um, it, it, you know, we're based here. It's, a, it's called Team New Zealand. So if the, if the situation is correct, come and you got a bloody will defend it absolutely can come back here but it's got to be correct because you'll lose it and then you you know it might take a couple of iterations before the situation financially is correct to come back here um but we want to take a bit of team you know new zealand with us to spain as well to hear the full interview download the platform at the app store via platform plus you can go back and listen to the whole show and all of the interviews in full Devlin. Yeah, the next rule. The platform. Grant Dalton with us there. If you didn't get to hear the full interview, just jump on the platform's YouTube channel. Or you can listen to the podcast tonight. We'll play you a fair chunk of it on that as well. It's only sport, and that's available at 5.30 and on Spotify or wherever you find your favourite podcasts. Christy Doran from the Raw out of Brisbane talking next Wallabies coach in a second. But We need to talk. It's time, Lachlan. We need to talk. What is your favourite game? What's my favourite game? Mm -hmm. I'm quite into the NFL right now. Oh, well, apart from that, the one we play on the air, you dickhead. Oh. Um, is my bet going to hit? Do I cash out? That's a fun game. I cashed out, by the way. Um, no, my favourite game is what is more Save chance of happening? Save with enthusiasm and bigger. What is more chance of happening? Next!
I present two scenarios to you. You tell me what has got more chance of happening. We're going back to yesterday. The All Blacks go through the whole of the season and only lose one match. Remember, we're away at South Africa twice. We play Ireland away. We play France away. Or someone other than Team New Zealand wins the America's Cup in Barcelona. What is more chance of happening? Uh, the All Blacks only lose one test. Same. Totally yeah. agree with you. I think that Team New Zealand are home and hosed yeah. with this. When you set the rules and you've been so dominant the last two regattas, there you go. it's very hard to see us not winning. Yeah, and it's, look, any sport that is so dominated by technology, whoever mm. has that advantage... And if you go back, it was before your time, really, but if you go back to Coots and Butterworth, and they talked about a 20-year dynasty, which was like four or five America's Cups. That's how ahead of the technology they were at the time. And I, I got a sneaking suspicion Dalton and his crew are at the same. All right, what is more chance of happening? Next! The All Blacks only lose one match and raise his first year tenure as coach, or, or the America's Cup does come back to Auckland and we get to host it next time. So we win it in Barcelona, then it comes back and we host it again in Auckland. What is more chance of happening? This is probably more wishful thinking, but I'd like to think that us bringing the America's Cup back here has got more chance of happening. Because I I got, I, I don't know if this is something I heard from someone or I just got the feeling of it, but I'm pretty sure I heard from someone that there was a there was a bit of unrest within the sailors themselves that it wasn't actually going to be in New Zealand. They actually really wanted it to still be here, but obviously it wasn't up to them where it was. And so I'd like to think there'd be some real championing from them to bring it back should they win it again. Yeah, clearly there's something also that didn't connect between government at the time and mm. Team New Zealand because you need a lot of funding from within New Zealand to be able to host this event. And they want to put it on a certain scale and the Labour government wasn't really into it that much. I don't really like their sport, do they? Well, not really. I mean, they not their white men's sport. Well, I, I think they pretended. Go the Highlanders! They kind of pretended, didn't they? So, yeah, I, I also don't think the All Blacks, I don't want to be a pessimist about this, I'm being a realist about this, I just don't think that we're going to go through the whole year and only lose one test. The Wallabies. The hapless, hopeless Wallabies. Last year's World Cup, their worst ever effort. Didn't get out of the group stage, remember? Eddie Jones, mate. Well, he had committed to four years. Uh, but at the same time, as he was slipping a ring on that Australian rugby finger, well, he was two-timing, and he was arranging a surreptitious date with Japanese rugby. So he's gone, but they haven't replaced him yet. Who's it going to be? Names swirling around include Joe Schmidt. Also, Stephen Larkham. Are they the two main contenders? Christy Doran, the Raw Brisbane Explains. Where are we at with who's going to be in charge of the Wallabies? It's a, it's a great question, and... And I was wrote a story on one of my first days back last week going, you know, what's the hold-up? Because at the moment, New Zealand rugby has got just put together an outstanding All Blacks coaching team, haven't they? With with Scott Robinson coming in there, he's obviously had months and months of preparation to get who he wants. And you look at across the ditch, and whilst it's, the All Blacks are having training camps, uh, we're, we're no closer yet to having a, a Wallabies coach there's no general manager, there's well, there's no team manager, there's no assistant coaches, uh, there's no money. Uh, it, it's quite a concerning aspect about where Australian rugby is at at the moment. And, and given that the Lions have already moved to their coast, it's less than 18 months away. This is one of the, the campaigns, one of the tournaments that Rugby Australia has pinned their hat on about getting money back into the game, hopefully turning a new page and... and uh, bringing back some faith in Australian rugby. It's so important to 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 get this next Wallabies coach and name them soon enough so that they can bring some confidence back into the game. You can start selling sponsorships. You can start selling headlines and then therefore hopefully getting some more people to come up to uh, the seats in Super Rugby, which is fast around the corner as well. So where are we at? We're, we're, we're at a process where there's probably a couple of candidates and Rugby Australia has got to sort out which one it is. I think that process has been completed. It was kind of infamously on LinkedIn. Uh, but I think Joe Schmidt is the favourite at the moment. Uh, there's probably one or two Aussies that are in the mix, but I, I think all roads at the moment are leading to Joe Schmidt. 
So, Phil War is the new CEO. He commands a lot of respect. David Nusifora, who we all know here in New Zealand, of course, he, he coached the Blues, but more as a Brumbies coach and his involvement with the Wallabies. Uh, he's he's on board in, a, in an advisory role. Stephen Larkin was the name that we all talked about last year. Is he still the front runner from an Australian perspective, as in, if, if you want an Aussie coach? Oh, um, Bernie Larkin's got a lot of commands, a lot of respect for his deeds in the playing field. The jury's still out. Everyone that I speak to, the jury's still out on, on him as a head coach and whether or not his personality fits to being a head coach, uh, how's his communication. And, and I've, I hear it's improved markedly from what it was back uh, last decade uh, since he's returned from a couple of years in, in Munster. Um I, I think he's applied for it. I don't think he's necessarily going to be right at the pointy end of this conversation. And uh, They've got to think about both short-term and long-term does Rugby Australia because for too long it's been kind of short-term fixes or not necessarily having the stability in place and having the, the building box in place for a head coach to thrive. Um, but on the other hand, a Lions and a World Cup within four years, wow, like that's a huge ask and two things that you want to go deep into. And... Um, so I, I just get the feeling like Stephen Lark is not going to be in that conversation. Uh, Michael Check could still be in that conversation. He's a free agent at the moment, having finished up with Argentina, uh, of course. Then again, has enough water gone under the bridge since you know, he ended in, in a, a real uh, a destructive kind of nature back in 2018, 2019. So I, I don't think the war was on the board at the time when... when Checker and Raylan Castle had a falling out. And then on the other hand, you've got Jim McKellar up at Leicester. And I think he's still interested. I think he may have softened slightly in terms of his hope or, or thoughts around coming back to take that role. He's, of course, got another two and a half years left with Leicester at the moment. And they're the only three Australian candidates. And one of the issues that I keep hearing at the moment is... Uh, financially, where are they going to get the money for the assistant coaches? How do we build the best team? Uh, because at the moment, uh, Rugby Australia clearly don't have a huge amount of money. The review's been handed in. They've probably looked at that um, and it wouldn't have been particularly uh, it wouldn't have been particularly favourable looking at anyone, including Rugby Australia, how, how balloons that budget got. So I think the assistant coaching team is going to be made up from super rugby coaches, and that's potentially on either side of the ditch as well. There's going to be a heavy Aussie flavour there, particularly if Joe Smith becomes the, the next Wallabies head coach. All right, finally then, is that who you're picking? Is your money on him? I think it is who I'm picking, and I've, I've said that for quite a few weeks now. Just the, uh, David Newsabour is going to have some involvement uh, as an advisor around who the next head coach should be. Uh, he's still with Ireland. He'll be with Ireland until the Olympics. Uh, but he's going to be adding his two cents in. Uh, Peter Horn had previously worked with Joe Schmidt. Uh, I think there's just too much synergy there for that not to occur. Um, it's whether or not Joe Schmidt really wants it and thinks he can succeed because not many foreigners have come to Australia and succeeded. The Tight Five. Five separate sporting uh, subjects, roughly a minute or so on each. And when the bell gives us the signal, well, we move quickly on to the next topic. So, yeah, cold in Buffalo. The fans go absolutely berserk in the snow. They love it there. It's just part of it. If you can't be a Buffalo Bills fan and not somehow learn to enjoy the cold, but the AFC, both semi-final games, we call it that, and the winner goes to the championship conference final the following weekend. Stay with me on this. It's kind of like a tennis tournament, quarters, semis, final, and then and then a super-duper final, which is the Super Bowl. So we'll talk about that, of course. Altmaier and Norrie, frauds and fakes, or is it just what it is, Lachlan, that the ASB Classic isn't that important to anyone? And that's why these guys pull out the back injury rather than play the tournament, because they've got bigger fish to fry in the Australian Open. Patrick Tuipalutu is replacing Dalton Papali'i as captain of the Blues. Now, one of the websites that I read today said, Dalton dumped as Blues captain. Of course, clickbait, as you can imagine. Is it that big a deal, really? Joe Parker has another fight lined up. And we've got to talk about his win over Deontay Wilder because that was one of the sporting highlights uh, of the Christmas period, was it not? 
Next Wallabies coach, is it going to be Joe Schmidt? Kicking off, though, we've been, both of us, watching a big time what is going on with the NFL at the moment. And you cashed your bet in at 98 bucks and took my advice. Buffalo Bills accounting for the Steelers today. Just one matchup still to come, and that's underway very shortly, and that is your Philadelphia Eagles away at Tampa Bay, the Buccaneers. So, the matchups are coming next weekend. Buffalo will play Kansas City in Buffalo. That's mm-hmm. Monday New Zealand time. And Baltimore Ravens, who've had the bye this weekend, uh, they are going to be hosting the Houston Texans, who only got in on the very last day of the season. Remember beating Indianapolis, the yeah, Colts. But and then they look- lost that game. Indianapolis would have won that division unless the Jags had won. Of course, they would have won. Anyway, Houston are going to. But then look Baltimore. what they did to the Browns. Yeah, but the Baltimore Ravens, who. I was going to call them a bit of a sleeper, but they're not really. I mean, they were a fantastic side. They should have gone a lot further in the playoffs over the last few seasons, and they have failed at at the time oh, so when you've really wanted. Yeah, I mean, there's only one of those years where I, where I would agree with that, which was the year that Lamar won the MVP, and they won 14 games and only lost two and then lost in their first playoff game. But every other year, he's either been... That's he's, the he's, been he's, injured. Been, he's been injured. Yeah. And this is the first year where he's actually been fully healthy. And they've got an incredible... Defensive group. They always have. I mean, Baltimore are renowned for their defence, all right? But with Lamar in charge, you've got to expect them to take care of the Texans. We'll ask HK about this, but I would expect that to be a rubber stamp job. And I'd expect them to be hosting whoever wins out of Kansas City and Buffalo. Which you'd probably have to lean towards the Bills at the moment. Well, well, they actually went to Kansas and won, remember, just weeks ago. And, you know, depending on... This is at home. mm -hmm. Mm. There is the Tay-Tay factor, of course. There is the... You love it, mate! Actually, here's a question for you. If Travis Kelsey wasn't a two-time Super Bowl champ, would he be the boyfriend? Like, I'm just saying, say it was Ooh. Lachlan War, who was Go playing on. for the Commanders, right? Yep. He's an NFL player. He gets on the field every week. Would she be there at the Commanders watching that load of pop lose every week? Or does the fact that Kansas City, with all the glamour that is associated with not just one, but two-time Super Bowl champs, does it have any part in it? Yeah, I, I can't imagine there'd be the same lure if she was dating Lachlan War, who was the backup punter who was only <laughs> playing because he was, the starter was injured. Oh, no, look, I'm not saying, I'm saying love is blind, of course, and all of that. But I suppose... It's like celebrity, celebrities always shack up with each other. Yeah. You never hear of a celebrity who's dating an absolute name working at finance. Okay, you know? Britney Spears, who was that guy that she... Yeah, and they're not together anymore, are they? No. Jennifer Aniston did the same thing, but he she married a bloke at- who was rich, didn't she? Yeah, I'm just thinking that... But that didn't as last. As far as concerned, she probably wouldn't get to meet somebody who's a low level, just any, any, anyone playing NFL. I mean, the kind of social functions and parties she'd go to would have to be A-list high-end, wouldn't they? So that's probably why if you're a Super Bowl champ, you get invited to these kind of things. Yeah. So I guess you've got to, you're stuck inside you your own bubble that, in a way. I just way. had him talking about Tay-Tay for the last minute. See? See? That's how easy it was. Oldmeyer and Norrie. Are these guys frauds and fakers? Or is Altmeier it just is. what it is? No, Oldmeyer. I think it's a bit harsh. Norrie's playing right now. How's he doing? Mm, Let's have a look. Have a look. First set. Uh, he won the first set 6-4. Go and he's on. up 40 love in the first... Po- the, f- the first point? In the first, first game, game of the second, of the second set. There we go. Excuse me. Yeah. yeah. So, well, he's up. Um, so if Norrie... Nursing that wrist injury right through it. If Norrie wins, he's a fraud, I agree. Um, and my what, he pulled out last Wednesday, uh, flew to Australia, played on a Monday for four hours. Four hours, two, two minutes. Two of those four sets that he played and went to tie breaks, and one of them, he won. Not one of the tie break sets, one of the other ones, uh, he won it. That's it. He won the first set. Yeah. Lost the next three. But fought for four hours in the heat. Incredible court coverage. And, and physical exertion from a guy who was so debilitated by his back injury last Wednesday night he had to withdraw midway through a match. I think the way that it works is that to get your appearance money or prize money, you have to play the first set and then start the next set. So that's what Altmaier did conveniently. Lost the first set. He was down 1-0 in the second set and then he mm. withdrew. It is an absolute fraud is what it is. And they need to be called out on it, these guys. Because it makes a mockery of everyone that actually pays their hard earned to go and watch. Um, I'm just speaking on behalf. Maybe, maybe it doesn't. Maybe those who go to the ASB Classic don't care. I'll say this: it's great to have some names there, but you're not going to the ASB Classic to what? What's his first name? Old Daniel Old Man. You're not going long to, you know, absorb the scintillating action of the German wonder kid that is no. No, 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 no. Altmaier. But what they did on centre court last Wednesday night, because he was the feature match and he withdrew. 
Uh, they put a couple of New Zealand juniors playing some kind of qualifying match on it and appealed to the crowd, because I had a friend who was there who was in a corporate box courtside, and she said, they appealed to the crowd, can you all please stay around and give these young guys at least some spectators to watch their game? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, I mean, Dave Woosley said it, it's a, it's a small tournament. It's absolutely a feeder for these players to go to the majors, uh, to go well, to go to the Australian Open. So I don't have a problem with it. And look, when you're there, at least for me, I I, ju- I don't think the people who are turning up are so phased by who's playing. They just none of them would be able to know. But you still deserve to, to see a match, though, don't you? Yeah, you do. I mean, they still got to see something. They got to see some kids play, I guess. But yeah. I, don't, I don't think the crowd are actually too phased. They still enjoy themselves. They don't care who do plays. Do you believe, like I do, though, that Altmaier deserves to be called out on this? Called out, yes, called, absolutely he does. Does he not? I'll tell you what. I actually think it'd be better if they were just honest and said, "Look, I got a match in the. Aust- I got to prepare for the Australian yeah, Open. Yeah. I, I forfeit." Yeah. And people would be like, "Oh, that's a bit lame," but okay, fair enough. At least there's truth in it. America's Cup could come back to Auckland, says Grant Dalton. We spoke to the Team New Zealand boss uh, about an hour ago or so. That interview will be available uh, on the platform. You can download Platform Plus and get all the benefits of being a subscriber to us. Or you can watch it on the YouTube channel. It'll be on the podcast tonight as well. That's great news. I really do hope it does. I don't have any doubt at all that Team New Zealand are going to defend the America's Cup and win it again. I, I just think I, I think it's one of the most obvious results in sport. We'll get all the way through to the final and everything else, and the other team will be competitive. But the way that Team New Zealand have won the last two, as you said earlier, Lachlan, you just kind of get the feeling that we've got technology up the wazoo, and whatever we've got, the others don't have. I'm not so sure our sailing team is that much better than everyone else's. I think we're... So, well, it's like Formula One. It comes down to the technology. Comes Everyone's technology. good, but yeah. it comes down to the what you're driving or piloting. And it's also like Formula One. Formula One goes through these phases where a team is dominant for about anywhere between six and ten years, really. Ferrari did it for a while. Mercedes were, um, were the best team for a long time. And then now it's Red Bull, and it's going to be Red Bull for a while. And it was like McLaren back in the 80s when they had the Honda engines. And it seems sailing's doing a similar thing now. I can't really speak much for it before sort of 2000. Um, but it's just the way that the technology evolves and how it's... As much of a computer as it is okay, here, a here's, sailing here's, here's the question. boat. What is more chance of happening? The America's Cup returns to Auckland or the Auckland City Council can get it organised? Because remember, they okay, lost the sale. There's GP. more chance it returns to Auckland and then it just doesn't Yeah, happen. because that's right, because Auckland City Council. It's taken three years to fix College Hill. Uh, every time it rains in Auckland, raw sewage pours out over all the beaches. In the height of summer, I mean, it's clean green New Zealand. Are you frustrated about this as a New Zealander? That here we are in the Queen City, the most popular city. What is the jewel in the crown? The harbour. Mm. And every time it rains, all the inner city beaches get black flagged because there's raw sewage all over it. Wellington, 33% of the water is pumping into the streets at the moment. And it's funny how every year when summer rolls around, they tell us, oh, don't go to these beaches because they're unsafe to swim at. Well, well where do we go? Well, there's, An hour and a half out west. Them bloody safe to swim yeah. at, you dickhead. But people still saw them. I mean, you know the, the, the row of beaches down at the bottom of, like, Hearn Bay, like Sentinel uh-huh. Beach and all those. Yep. I was swimming at Sentinel Beach the beaches. other day. Yep. The, yes, there was a woman without a bra on, no, no, my no, flatmate and no, I. There was Guy with, oh, no. with full no. Johnson out on one of those beaches. Just disgusting. Big, hairy dude. It's just like, what the... Anyway... Joe Parker has got a, another fight. Uh, this is great news for Joseph. He's going to be fighting a Chinese opponent. I don't know anything about this guy, I, I, I've got to say. Uh, Zile Zhang, it's going to be in Saudi Arabia. The guy is 40 years old. I'd like to concentrate more on what Joseph achieved against Deontay Wilder. And we spent a lot of time on this before the break lock. We had Joseph on the program um, and he was really confident. And I'm very enthused always about Joseph. I really like the dude. But I mean, I, I had huge doubts about this. I didn't think he had the ability, but he absolutely smoked that guy. Mm. There was there was one fight. There was no question about the decision at the end. Yeah. There was no controversy attached. You knew he had won out of the 12 rounds. He had won 10 of them or something, right? Yeah. It was a really... It was the best fight ever. Technically, it was brilliant. Yeah, it was. From him. And it, I uh, I was I was overseas when I was on, so I didn't get to watch it. I saw bits and pieces here and there, but it just kind of looked like Wilder. I don't know. I'm not a boxing expert. This is just the feeling I got while watching it. He just kind of was like, yeah, I'll turn up and I'll throw a massive haymaker and I'll win. That's and exactly, there wasn't much exactly other preparation, right. that's exactly, whereas that's Joe it. actually technically sharpened his game. Look, uh, wh- whatever he did in the camp, and he talked about, you know, these trainers and, and, and all the work they did, whatever he did, do it again, Joseph, do the same thing again, bro. 
Next Wallabies coach, is it going to be Joe Schmidt? You'll never get an answer out of Joe Schmidt. Man, he's hard to get hold of. He's hard He's hard to get a word out of. He just doesn't do any media at all. But Christy Doran, about half an hour ago, confident that it is him. See, I would have thought that Larkin was an absolute laydown, locked in for that job. Well, they've done two Kiwi coaches before. And burned them both. Yeah, and the first of those two... Um, was Robert Deans the first ever Kiwi mm-hmm. Wallabies coach? He actually ended up having not a bad tenure because that sort of was the start of the well, downfall. He beat Graham Henry's rugby. All Blacks in his very first test, mate. Yeah, he did. Um, by a lot as well. It was like 17 or 18 points they won by. Um, it's, so it's a bit strange they're going with another foreigner. It's not as if Joe Schmidt's that foreign. He's a Kiwi. And obviously we, we're not too far different from Australia. But I, I would have thought they would have gone with an Aussie and just yeah, stuck same, within their same. own system. Especially with... Someone who the cares World about Cup the jersey coming in 2027. Yeah. Someone who cares about the jersey a lot, because that's. You, you, well, you, I mean, you, Joe Schmidt's got a great successful record, you know, coaching Ireland and everything else. But yeah, I would have thought. I mean, Larkin to me, he's he's a superstar yeah. of Australian rugby. But I've always, like, he's I, coached well with the Brumbies. Yeah, he had. He, yeah, and he 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 was part of the glory days, more or less, for the Wallabies. So he will care about getting them back to that point more than anyone else, I think. And also, I've always thought this, when Robbie Deans and Dave Rennie are standing there, this will be Joe Schmidt, should he get the job, and you're singing the Australian National Anthem, do you mean it? And when the Kiwi one's playing, do you sing that or do you ignore it? Well, I asked Joe Schmidt that when I was playing the All Blacks, mate. I mean, remember, he was the first Irish guy to, to, Irish coach to leave. Like, how much do you actually want to beat the All Blacks? It happened in Chicago. Um... Finally, look, Everton and Nottingham Forest have been smacked or will be smacked by the Premier League. And this is uh, the fair play rules and regulations. That decision came out overnight. We're going to deal with that tomorrow. Miles Davis is going to walk us all through that. But it looks as though both could be deducted points and that would be more points for Everton as well. The questions remain... How come Man City get away with it? Their 115 corrupt charges, right? How come Newcastle get away? How can Chelsea get away with spending a billion dollars in the last transfer window? Well, New, Newcastle haven't had. I remember when Man City's owners took over, their Middle Eastern owners took over in 08 or 09, around then, um, and they just bought all these guys for a lot of money. Remember, they spent so much on Sean Wright Phillips, who turned out to be a real flame Damien for Chelsea. Duff. Damien Duff played. as well. Mm. Newcastle. Well, they, they know Man City have done this recently with Calvin Phillips, I know, for but, example. Uh, but the, with with Newcastle at least, I, they haven't had the same extravagant spending, at least from what I've seen. So I'm not too sure about them. With Man City and Chelsea, well, look, the, the the rule around it is that you can't have lost 105 million over three years. Over three years, yeah. pounds it is. And so if you're Man City or Chelsea, couldn't you just get a massive injection from your owners to then say, no, we're not losing it because we're still. Make, m- well, no, you meant to, meet. you're meant to earn legitimate income yeah. so it stops the big billionaire owners just pumping money into the club and well, buying the world's best Well, do you remember when Man City bought Harlem? How much did they pay for 55 it? $55 million. million pounds. If you're Dortmund... I tell you what, that is like, where buying, is the a logic? Fer- that's like buying a Ferrari for $30. Yeah. Later so there was an under-the-table deal there. You know there. there was something went on, don't you? Mark Watson, the ATM Podcast, episode 66. What a broadcaster of much note. Covered so many international events, Olympics, athletics... World Cups. He appears on other radio stations doing sports shows as well and very generously gives us his time every single Tuesday. What are we talking about? We're talking about Sky TV. Cost-cutting measures there as they up our prices. He explains. Sky TV, who just before Christmas again increased our prices. And then you look at things like the coverage of the ASB Classic, where they refuse to put local commentators in, so they take the the, the English guys who absolutely you know, butchered the porphyry and, and Nati Fatu and all the language and stuff like that. Then when it comes to the doubles, and I know this for a fact, they did it off-site. They didn't even set up a studio at Stanley Street at all. They had guys sitting there in Mount Wellington calling it. So they're putting up our prices. At the same time, they're obviously seriously cutting their own costs. You've got Netball New Zealand who are now sitting there fretting, wondering what kind of deal they're going to get offered over the ANZ Premiership because rumours are that Sky are going to go back to them and say that it's only worth half the money. It's not making any money. And yet on the opposite side of that, here they are promoting the hell out of women's rugby. I know it's an old chestnut we keep beating, but I'm just looking at it purely from an economic model here, Mark. Women's rugby makes no money. Women's rugby will not make any money for a very long time. Women's rugby costs so much money, yet you're not allowed to talk about that, yet they're prepared to hammer netball, which is still the preeminent, most major women's sport in the country. This has not got the publicity it deserves. No, look, they're wanting to sell a business, clearly. So what they're wanting to try and do is maximise the sale of Sky. They've already tried once. 
uh, turn the whatever offer down from whatever um, partner or potential buyer was interested that was never disclosed publicly. So what they're doing here is they're just continually reducing costs. I've spoken to camera people who have said that even production values at games like rugby, they've gone from eight cameras to six cameras and they're reducing the general production qualities. They're using sort of uh, contractors to come in you know, companies that historically have been sort of more involved in live streaming. Um, so not quite the full sort of outdoor production trucks that you expect. So what they're basically doing is cutting, reducing costs at every level, increasing prices and trying to create a false economy. So they'll increase their profits. Um, and that's just really to try and sell this business for more than it's actually worth. Uh, it's a business that's around transaction. There's nothing invitational about it now as the consumer. Um, and so that's really the reason for it. It's it's skullduggery. It, it, it's just so morally corrupt. Um, and if you're a shareholder, you've got to be overly concerned. You know, they're trying to make out that they're still relevant. But really, really, um, I think they're in a world of trouble here. I don't think it's an organisation that's particularly well led. I think, as we've said, and I think it's been highlighted that, I think there has been a lot of identity politics, which I think have been more important to those running this organisation than actually thinking about the shareholders, actually thinking about the consumer. Uh, look, I, I can understand. Look, I, I, I'm probably in agreement. I, just, I, I think you could get rid of netball, and I don't think Sky would be affected at all. I genuinely say that. I still think Sky is predominantly a male platform, and I still think that most people that purchase Sky are predominantly the males in the house. However, however, um, netball is still relevant. And you've still got to have local content. Is it worth what it once was? Probably not. And that's now an issue that netball have to face. And this is just the harsh reality of women's sport and sport in general. You can jump up and down. You can look at models overseas, but it's still got to make economic sense. And you can play the political game and you can go down and you can talk about um, and you can talk about oppression over the years and, you know, f and make all the excuses for why women's sport is not the economic model that perhaps some men's sport is. But the reality is people just aren't watching it like they did. And you can apply the same to a lot of men's sport. But it is a tough one when you see them still continuing to invest and show women's rugby. The only reason they're doing it is clearly it must be a contractual obligation with the deal they've done with New Zealand rugby. When they signed that deal, they must have a contractual obligation. I guarantee if they could get out of it, they would, because the production costs of running any live sport are significant. You're talking a minimum of $25,000, probably more around $50,000 a game. Now, no one is watching it. You know that, and I know that as well. So... Yeah, look, I think I think Sky are being very disingenuous at the moment. It's all about trying to sell this business. It's all about trying to inflate the value of it, and you do that by increasing the cost, increasing the price to the consumer, reducing the costs um, around the business, and creating a little bit of a false economy in the short term. But whoever ends up buying this business, a lot of damage is done in the long term, Martin. You know, in, in, in terms of the way that they are covering sports at the moment, Sky TV, uh, it's, it's just, it's this this thing where they're refusing to, to send people to grounds. I mean, this is as disingenuous as it gets, isn't it, Mark? The whole yep. point of live sport is that you have to have people at these venues because that's where you imbibe, you get the atmosphere. Uh, you know, it, it creates a different broadcasting experience as much as, much as it creates a different spectator experience. Uh, uh, I agree, Martin. And, and what they did with the tennis is, again, just another part of this cost cutting. This is about reducing costs because they want to sell the business. So, you, you know, if you're not spending money, that's more money on the profit line. But again, you end up losing it. Look, I've recently last year did quite a bit of commentary remotely. So I was actually doing commentating events in Europe and I was doing it from my living room at home and I struggled as a commentator I just never felt like I was there never felt like I was really in the moment never really felt the atmosphere and I think that probably came through maybe in my commentary as well and you know it's not like we're having to send a large crew to Australia to cover this it's at ASB it's at Stanley Street in Auckland it's a 20 minute drive from the Sky Studios but they're clearly calling it off tube um, you know and then they got and because of cusp cost cutting originally and bringing in um, English commentators from overseas to do it, they got themselves into trouble, didn't they, when it came to Māori protocol and, and pronunciation, and then suddenly they sort of were running for cover. And that's always the risk when you start cutting costs. You get what you sort of pay for a little bit. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's interesting, isn't it? But we'll still we'll still turn up to rugby and we'll have a cast of 10,000 um, pre-game commentators and different hosts all trying to tell us everything that we already know, half an hour build up to try and sell more advertising revenue. And look, I'll, I'll, I'll say this, you know, I've had some experiences with Sky in recent times. 
And, and yeah, I, I, I think the whole organisation is just incredibly poorly run. I think the governance is poor. Um, and they're just fortunate that they've got a monopoly because they would not survive in a competitive marketplace under their current leadership and under their current vision. And you've got to start actually thinking about the consumer again and actually start thinking about the fan and start thinking about us. Because as I've said in the past, Sky is no longer the default setting at night. For most people I talk to, there's very little stuff on there that's actually appointment viewing. Um, you know, they continue to invest heavily in a product that nobody's interested in. I think they've been complicit in part of that and taking the interest out of rugby because, as you know and I know, yes, they have these TV programs, but it's fluff. Nothing's ever said. There's no, there's no discussion ever generated. There's nothing actually engaging about anything they do. They're just more interested in putting press releases out about, um, hey, look, we've got 29 women fronting TV shows this week. Now, I've got no problem with that. If they're the right people, that should not be the focus. Focus on the quality, focus on the content, focus on the consumer, and put your political issues and your your personal values to one side and actually start running this organisation commercially and responsibly. To hear the full interview, download the platform at the App Store. Via Platform Plus, you can go back and listen to the whole show and all of the interviews in full. That's our podcast for today. Thank you so much for listening. If you want to listen to the entire show, 1 to 4, Monday to Friday, download the Platform app and via Platform Plus, you can go back and listen to whatever shows over however many weeks at your leisure, at your listening pleasure, Platform Plus. First thing to do, though, is download the Platform app. Devlin. Unbelievable. Incredible. The Platform.